So what if you had a chance to talk to a former leader of a notorious prison gang, incredibly powerful prison gang that literally took over multiple penitentiaries and ran things through the effective use and the effective threat of violence. Do you think there'd be anything that would be worthwhile? Do you think maybe we could learn something? How could a self-defense, you know, person like myself get anything useful out of a conversation like that? Well, you're going to be the judge because we're going to have that conversation today. I first found out about uh, this individual, Mike Thompson, when I was given an article from the New Yorker around 2004, and the article was about something called the brand, and the brand was a name used by the Aryan Brotherhood, and it really talked about this elite group of prisoners that had very specific skill sets, and they molded themselves into an incredibly powerful gang, even though they make up a very small percentage of the prison population. Uh, I never thought that I'd have a chance to interview Mike and anybody that knows my, um, that knows my, uh, training. If you've attended a live training, you're familiar with Michael Thompson. I've used him. There's a national geographic piece that was done on, um, the Aryan brotherhood and Michael's featured in it. Uh, he's a large man. He was 6'4 at the time when he was at his height uh, of influence and power. He was about 280 pounds to 300 pounds. And just to show, you can see uh, that's him uh, showing his shamrock tattoo, which basically gave him um, just carte blanche in there. That By earning that tattoo, he was able to you know, basically be a shot caller and very, very influential. Um, you can kind of see his size here. Michael's the one obviously with the beard and the longer hair. Um, he's, a, he's a large man and he's extremely capable. He has a lot of information on close combat, um, particularly multi-attacks, multi, multiple, multiple attackers and uh, the use of knives and improvised weapons. The mindset is of interest. Now I gotta be very clear. This interview is not to glorify prison gangs. This interview has really has very little to do with the Aryan Brotherhood as uh, other people have covered it. If you are interested in the Aryan Brotherhood, if from a history standpoint, um, there's many different sources, there's many different places on YouTube. Our focus here is on trying to get you the best information when it comes to your self-protection. And that's gonna take us to some uncomfortable places and we're gonna go there today. Oftentimes I've said, you know, Reality is often disappointing and inconvenient. And some of the best information on your self-protection can come from the worst parts of society. And the conversation that I had, this is the first part, it's a two-part conversation that I'm having with Michael Thompson. I think you're gonna find it extremely useful. If you keep your mind open to the idea of not just dismissing this because it's a criminal organization, uh, Michael's history, he did 45 years behind bars. I never thought I'd have a chance to actually talk to him. And he's been recently released um, in California. And he is, uh, you know, currently in legal, um, the legal process of challenging his original um, conviction, which is interesting. We go into that a little bit in the, in the conversation. Um, it's relevant from the standpoint that we were talking about somebody who had no cr criminal record prior to this, uh, what, what happened to him and when he got indoctrinated and how through the successful use of violence, he was able to acquire power and what they were able to do with that. And there's lots of lessons for us to be learned in this. So again, it's a little bit longer. If you stick with it, you're going to find incredible information. If you're just going to glance over it, it'll probably be worthless to you. But I have, uh, I've done a lot of interviews over the years. I've interviewed a lot of people. Um, I rarely had such a direct conversation with somebody who can eloquently and just calmly talk about the most extreme circumstances any of us can imagine. So without further ado, here is my interview 
part one with Michael Thompson. Okay, it's my pleasure to have Michael Thompson on today for this interview. Um, <clears throat> a lot of you are familiar with Michael if you've been watching my, uh, my uh, teachings over the years. I found Michael to be an invaluable source to the realities of, of violence, uh, how, how they look at it. Michael lived in what I always term for you guys, a petri dish of asocial, asocial violence and some of the toughest penitentiaries in uh, the country and became really a, a lead, uh, a leader in a very, very prominent gang, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. And he was, a, you know, his journey to that is, is worth us looking at. And I always tell people that some of the best information when it comes to your self-protection comes from the worst parts of society. Michael mm -hmm. immersed himself in, in that and had to survive. I think, Mike, could, could we start with the conversation you and I were having? I thought it was really relevant. You growing up, you can, I'd love to you talk a little bit about your mentor, what, what he meant to you. But what was really interesting was your, your relationship with fighting and violence in the rodeo world that you were there mm -hmm. as a young competitor with some of the older guys. And then the transition after you were convicted and put into prison mm -hmm. and then dealing with that type of violence, what the changes were, because here's the issue. Most people, um, <clears throat> thankfully, will never have to experience what you, you experienced in, in that. But if they run into somebody, you know, from that world or with that type of a mindset, and they're unprepared to deal with somebody who has, you know, the violence, uh, the, the idea of how to use violence as a survival tool and how to, you know, antiseptically look at another human, um, I think that's really interesting because when, you know, when you talked about how it was when you were a young man and, you know, having to deal with, you know, fighting and violence and stuff like that versus what it was like as a whole different world in prison and how, how that came about. So I think that would be a good starting point. Okay. Yeah. It, it's, um, and I think it's an important distinction that you're making between what one might consider fighting as sport, um, like when I was on the rodeo circuit and the idea that it was just a carryover from the competition within the arena um, as a bull rider. And so that if I had bested an individual in a bull ride and, and we were all camped uh, around the rodeo uh, arena that night and uh, they got liquored up, then they wanted that second chance um, to best me. And um, so that when you see that kind of competitiveness, it's, it's um, very similar to sport. That would be true with the loggers, same thing. Um, but now when you make that transition into a controlled environment such as prison, um, fighting is no longer for sport. Um, because when it is a, a, when that sport component is inherent to what you're doing, um, there's a sense of uh, rules, if you will. If you knock a man down, you let him get up type thing. In prison, not so. So in prison, the violence uh, becomes tenfold. It's extreme and its intent is um, vastly different um, than the other circumstances that I was talking about within the rodeo or the loggers or whatever it may be. Um, so the intent there is to um, incapacitate your opponent as quickly and as efficiently as possible and as brutally as possible. And that, that requires a, um, a mindset, um, not just a perspective, but a mindset um, that whatever you're going to do, you're going to do it uh, as efficiently um, as possible and as um, brutally as possible. And that's primarily because in a controlled environment, you have limited time. Although um, back in the 70s, when you engaged in a knife fight, and I've engaged in many of them, um, it was a head up type situation so that uh, each opponent had a knife and you were usually you had point men that kept point relative to guards intruding and um, oftentimes you would have more than sufficient time uh, to do what you were going to do um, in a knife fight uh, it can be very quick or it can be prolonged you were talking about um the goal in prison being you know, you, you had time to do that, but, but that the intent 
I guess, is, is much is much different. Now, there's an illusion also, not an illusion, but there's an assumption that everything is about, you know, um, killing. And, mm -hmm. and that's it. And, I, and I, I understand, and we'll talk more about when you were in, you went in the 70s and, and 70s, 80s, uh, and 90s. But what's going on today, there's probably there's there's a there's a little um, that, that, that'll be interesting to talk about where where prison is currently as far as violence is concerned. But you talked about the fact that it would be head up. And just so people understand, it's just that's, that's two guys that know what's going on. It's not mm -hmm. an attack from behind. It's not an ambush. It is it is to either for a status situation to resolve mm -hmm. something. Um, can you kind of explain that part of the culture? I can, yeah. It, it um, and you're right. The prison today is is much different. Uh, it's more about assassination. So uh, the idea of just committing murder for the sake of murder, um, as efficiently as possible. So usually, what will happen is you'll have more than one person, sometimes two, sometimes three individuals. Um, although it does happen on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but it's by surprise. Um, as opposed to uh, the individuals know what's going on. The, the situation I'm talking about when um, I first went into the prison system uh, was um, what I refer to as a head up, man on man, each had a knife, um, and it was a knife fight. So there was actually a, a style or a form of fighting that became important. Um, for those who have been in knife fights, um, the idea here is not to simply stab, um, although that's a part of it, but it's more like a dance. So for instance, if I had uh, a 10 minute, 15 minute knife fight, then the issue would be to bleed my opponent. And um, that's a matter of uh, cutting the wrist, cutting the extremities uh, so that you bleed that individual and uh, he becomes weak right. um, as a result of the loss of blood. Um, other times it's different. It, it depends on the skill set of the individuals involved, but where you have two individuals that actually know how to fight, uh, particularly with knives, then it can be a prolonged fight. Um, and you had back then, you had that time because you had point men. Right. And um, so um, that's a completely different dynamic as it relates to that violence. And the objective, um, depending on the individuals involved, um, may not be to kill, uh, at least in, in, from my perspective, it was not. If um, And I never found the need to actually take an individual's life. Um, once I was able to um, defeat that individual, uh, sometimes that required uh, taking a lung um, or bleeding that person. But um, I suppose the point is, is it's the difference between um, finesse as it relates to a skill set within that given environment or um, just uh, um, like two bulls uh, locking horns. And I've actually seen that too and been engaged in that too. And that's close quarter combat um, where you're out on a tier and you're meeting out on a tier. And um, so it's a different type or style of fighting. Um, but I suppose the issue as it relates to what you're talking about is the intensity, the level of intensity, uh, the energy uh, associated with that. Um, and, and then of course the intent, um, you can't have two individuals who one intent is simply to disable and the other intent is to kill. Right. Um, you start off at the same level. And if you arrive at a point in the course of that altercation, uh, where you realize that uh, you have your opponent, and in my case, I should say, I realize I have my opponent, right. uh, then it would be simply a matter of putting that person down and making sure he stays down. Now, I've, I've been in knife fights where I've had, I've defeated my opponent, and um, he presumed correctly so that I was going to kill him. And I've had them plead for their life. And um, there were times, I have to admit, where I left, um, an indication um, because the complaint towards my style of fighting back then was that if I left him alive, he would come back another day to kill me. And um, so I've had circumstances where I did defeat an opponent 
And um, I simply choked up on my knife and, and uh, tattooed a circle, for instance, around his heart um, with a shortened version of the knife, just to remind him. Um, I, I know that sounds brutal and gruesome, but in the, and it is, but in that environment, um, it works. Well, that's, that's, that's what's, um, the reason I, the reason I'm going down this road is I want mm -hmm. people to understand that, um, you are, you, for me, you're, you're a unique individual in that you didn't come in from a street gang criminal background. You came mm -hmm. in, you hadn't, you had no criminal record prior to, uh, right. the, the, the murders that you were accused of and, and, mm -hmm. and came in. And what was interesting was you, you, you know, the way I look at it is you were familiar with violence. You were well-trained, uh, you know, growing up, you had a really good mentor who yes. gave you the basics. Um, mm -hmm. But you, I don't know if this was a conscious thing, but what people need to understand is I think people think you get in there, you get into prison right away and like you're either forced to join a gang or, and that is true for some people. Some people are, are, mm -hmm. are joined through intimidation. You're one of the rare individuals that you came in and you were almost, you know, you were like a, like a high-end NFL recruit. Um, mm -hmm. Why? Because you were able to show your ability. I mean, you had a multi-attacker situation that you had to deal with where you had multiple mm -hmm. people. And I think by showing your skill set and your confidence, there's probably once you knew you had them, mm -hmm. I think it's almost in that environment, a power play to, mm. to be able to do what you did in some ways. Meaning I think, I think that would probably leave people even more um, cautious about, about, about dealing with you in some way, shape or form. And the reason I think that's important is I try to tell people all the time that, you know, the one thing I've learned about prison when I, when I go in the, the, the use of violence is true currency for, for you. Yes. And you were able to establish currency in that mm -hmm. before you were a member of any gang. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I just think it's unique in the fact that you came into a situation, I think you had a decision to make. It's like, okay, I'm going to do, am I going to do my time on my own and realize this is going to be a daily event for me. I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have random, random challenges, or am I going to recognize the situation I'm in make a choice that isn't the greatest choice. But when you looked at everything, it was like, do I want to be part of an organization where I have some status in here, where I have some ability to uh, control my environment or not? And I think your ability through being successful, you know, using that you're, you know, you're six, four at the time, you told me you're about 280 pounds, mm -hmm. very adept. I think, you know, I think people just need to understand that that was a very, that's a, that's a, it's a unique way to come in. Um, it is. Yeah, it's a way. transition. It's the transition itself. When I first came in, now, in order to understand that, you have to go back to the trial itself. And uh, in my naivete, I thought the only thing I had to do was go in and tell the truth, not realizing that within prison subculture, that that's a rat. That's a snitch. That's an informant. Right. Um, you know, so that when you get on the stand and you tell the truth, and which is what I did, so that when I arrived in prison, I had that jacket on me already, and I had to overcome that almost immediately, violently, um, and did. So that when I was transferred from Chino, which is the reception center at the time, I went to a dual vocational institution, that's Tracy, yeah. and I went to work for the chaplain, and um, I actually did attempt to do my own time. Um, but there came a point in time when that didn't work. It, it took a while. Um, and there are a number of dynamics associated with that that brought that about so that ultimately I didn't really make the decision about controlling my environment um, until after being in prison a few years. And that's when I was sent to Old Folsom. And in being sent to Old Folsom, um, you know, I was with the big boys now. That, that's called the big house. Right. And so I was uh, uh, confronted with you know, the Black Panthers, the Black Guerrilla family, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Mexican Mafia, the Texas Syndicate, and um, all of the leaders associated with those particular groups were there. Charlie Manson, uh, his outfit, um, I mean, all of them. Right. And so um, when I was first, the first group that attempted to recruit me were the Black Panthers. And um, when I refused that, um, their leader, uh, Hugo Yogi Pinnell um, challenged me um, very simply, just when I denied him 
um, that recruitment process. He just said, well, he said, uh, you go on in, called me young Mike. He said, young Mike, you go on in and you make yourself a knife and I'll meet you out here in the morning. Um, very casual, very conversational, um, but, and also very respectful. And so I did just exactly what uh, he had instructed me to do. And we met out on the yard in the morning and uh, we went head up. Um, it's a different situation. When I say head up, you don't have the time. It's a big yard, uh, but you're under the gun and you have to keep moving. You understand that immediately. But at that point in time, when um, he realized he was losing the knife fight, he ran. And um, back then when you called a man out, um, you didn't run in the course of losing the fight. So that created a, a, um, a split within the Black Panthers and the BGF at the time. He was actually back Black Panther. He was never actually BGF, but he had that influence. Um, point being um, is that it was at that point that I began to assess um, controlling my environment, controlling my resources, because the next group to approach me was the Aryan Brotherhood. And I'd actually declined them also. Um, but it wasn't until uh, four natives who were also brand at the time, um, and I grew up on the reservation, uh, approached me and said, uh, they knew I was a res dog. So they approached me and said, look, brother, we, we live better in here than we ever did on the res. And uh, um, they began to explain how they controlled their resources. And in truth, that appealed to me. And so that I could see in assessing um, my environment and the terrain in which I lived, um, that I had a decision to make. I had to make a choice. Um, and so I made the choice to actually join the brand. But in doing that, I also realized immediately that um, there was an enormous potential uh, to utilize the resources that were available to that group but weren't being utilized other than to put uh, drugs into the arms of the individuals that were controlling those resources. Right. Uh, that just simply didn't make any sense to me. I'm not a drug user. I never have been. Um, but they were generating um, enormous revenues and they did have control over their environment. Um, and so I began to um, talk with other individuals who were influential within the organization and we began to restructure it. And it was that restructuring process that uh, led to um, ultimately uh, my leadership role within the group um, within a year. Now, a lot of that admittedly had to do with my physical abilities. Right. So, um, you know, every time I went to the yard, I was in a knife fight. Every time. Um, you know, you, I don't know how many of you have read that uh, book, Liver Eaton Johnson. Um, but uh, when the natives had killed his wife and child, uh, then uh, it became a matter of honor that he meet uh, members of the tribe whenever they encountered each other. And that was an ongoing thing. And it was the same with me. Uh, having defeated um, one of their leaders, um, each and every time I went to the yard, I was challenged uh, again. And so I went through a number of altercations before the Aryan Brotherhood even approached me. So you're right in so far as that, um, that currency that you're talking about yeah. and having established myself, given my skill set, um, prior to ever becoming a member of any organization. So, um, and, and that went a long way, you're right. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was kind of a, <clears throat> like a theme that I see th throughout that, mm -hmm. um, it's not the only thing because it, you no. know, there are low level guys that are very good at violence, but they're not good at anything else. They're not, they're not yeah. leaders. Um, right. But, but you, it, it's difficult to be a leader at the level you are a leader without being able to have that cachet of, you know, I, mm -hmm. I can handle myself and people know, I think you said it in the Nat Geo uh, piece really, really succinctly where you said, uh, inmates in here will always fear me because they think I will kill them if they don't do what I say versus yeah. with the guards, they know they have, you know, their things. So meaning staff, you used, you said staff, not the guards, but they'll, mm -hmm. they'll fear you more than staff. And, and it's mm -hmm. that, it's that backing up of everything with the, with violence, um, mm -hmm. that you have to, 
look at it. And, and from our perspective, from the perspective of this conversation, what I'm trying to get people to understand is when you have to look at violence that way, you can't afford to have opinions. You can't afford to have, you know, quote unquote styles. You can't, you need to get results. Mm -hmm. And then yes. when you saw, when you came into this organization and you saw the potential, meaning, Hey, mm -hmm. these guys already control this area. They're good at this, they're good, but they don't see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You gave, you, you helped create, uh, along with everybody else, Mm -hmm. um in, in that organization you guys realize hey we need something bigger than ourselves we need we need to create mm -hmm. this mission because listen it, you see it all the time that m men crave uh missions they, they they crave to belong they crave to be part of something bigger than themselves and mm -hmm. i would imagine you know in the prison it's even more so because it's such a desolate lifestyle that if you, yeah. if you don't have that so can you talk about how you you guys revamp that what kind of protocols you put in i think it's also very interesting what you know the reason you were such a small organization was because each individual had to have a skill set i'll let you say it that is absolutely mm -hmm. just in, and and everybody understands where i'm coming from impressive yeah. in the environment that we're talking about could, mm -hmm. you, could you could you talk to that a little bit sure you know it, what, what you're really talking about is um not just the physical prowess associated with what you're doing um but educating yourself relative to um, optimizing your control over those resources. Um, and that goes hand in hand with a, a business approach uh, to what you're doing. It made absolutely no sense to me, for instance, that you're generating these revenues and you're, you're not doing anything with it other than shooting dope into your arms. Right. Um, and that makes no sense. So the idea of restructuring uh, was to take a, a business perspective. Um, as it relates to that. And, and there are a number of things that go along with that. Uh, first and foremost, an infrastructure as it, as it relates to that business enterprise, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So for instance, if, and you're right, when you make reference to the fact that it was a small group and the premise of that small group was that each individual had sufficient skill uh, to control the environment on his own. Um, physically, intellectually, psychologically, and otherwise. Some were better at that than others, right. um, obviously. And then you get into the uh, sociopathic factors and, and, and you know, the psychopaths and, and the like. But that really wasn't a consideration at that point. Um, there's a lot said about uh, you know, racism. Um, that simply was not inherent to the organization at that time. It, it, it no more existed within the Aryan Brotherhood, which is just a name, as it than it did with the black gorilla family or the black panthers or the mexican mafia um, each and every one of those organizations was intent on controlling uh, their environment and their resources and and did so as it relates to their uh, specific ethnicity um, but racism actually wasn't tolerated and the reason that it wasn't you know, was because it got in the way of business right. and um, whenever you're engaging in business enterprise, uh, the issue is profits. So that if you're in a race war, um, you're shutting down the prison essentially, and you're not making profits. And so that makes no sense. So what you do is that you put in place with those factors. Um, and that requires training. Uh, it requires education. Um, and it requires an understanding of environment um, as a subculture. So I, I can see that uh, I've got a, your internet connection is unstable across my screen right now. So that if, uh, I'll just give it a minute and, and, and uh, allow your editor to deal with that. No problem. But um, let me uh, go into that idea of, uh, I'll just give an example you know, of that. There was a point in time when um, there was warfare going on between the Black Gorilla family, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Black Panthers, the Texas Syndicate, um, all within the confines of um, the whole. Um, in other words, it wasn't impacting the main line. So the, the battles were actually occurring within the whole itself. And, but it was still about um, maintaining your resources um, within that environment um, as rival gangs, that that took the pressure off of them by way of their own safety. And so what they would do is they would use intelligence, um, those individuals that 
they utilized as conduits to feed information to the gangs. And um, they would create strife um, amongst the gangs by way of, you know, this person's going to hit this person and this is going to happen. And um, the gangs would react to that as opposed to respond. And um, once I realized that this was happening, as we squared off on the yard one day um, with knives and uh, quite a few individuals, um, I asked everybody to stop what they were doing and they actually listened to me and I pointed up to the second tier of the hole the windows faced the yard and up in the windows were guards taking book as individuals squared off against each other and I said look at them look what they're doing they're controlling us and here's how they're doing it you know and they all saw it and they all understood it immediately. And so we entered into a truce at that moment uh, that we would no longer engage in warfare against each other, particularly based on information that was essentially coming from the guards. And um, so we actually came together uh, as groups and um, the warfare stopped. And so then the emphasis was to set down as diverse organizations and hammer out just exactly what we were going to do and how we were going to do it within the confines, if you will, of our own ethnic groups. Uh, and that changed the entire infrastructure of the prison itself relative to the warfare that was occurring up to that time. And so then. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did institute relative to that was counterintelligence as it relates to the guards and the administration that we were dealing with. Um, so that came down to um, infiltrating um, by way of counterintelligence, um, the guards and the administration. And one of the ways I did that was um, by understanding uh, their use of what I refer to as conduits and uh, feeding those conduits information and then watching how that information came back to me. And that generally told me who I was dealing with and um, what they were attempting to do. And then I would counter that um, strategically. Um, I always had a plan in place, but uh, I've, I've long understood that there's a difference between a plan and a strategy. You can have a plan, but the strategy changes from day to day and you have to be able to um, acclimate to that, uh, adjust to that, and adapt to that. So adaptation becomes the key. And in a leadership role, that becomes critical uh, based on the influence that you have upon your group uh, by way of their training and their understanding. And that is actually what exemplifies leadership within any business, is that you have um, your leadership recognizing what your terrain is, infiltrating your opposition as it relates to that, and then utilizing that uh, to the benefit of the group uh, by way of counterintelligence. You, you also give examples where, uh, you know, when you were, um, uh, when, when you'd be in, you, you, you never had a problem having a, a phone. Uh, right. You never had a problem. I mean, things that, and, and, and that oftentimes it wasn't until you worked with law enforcement years later, that you're able to share just how pers uh, pervasive your guys control within the institution was. Mm -hmm. And can you also talk to the fact about how they screwed up? You built this, you built this institution and their attempt to break it up by taking those into They actually helped you guys by taking mm -hmm. individuals and putting them in other penitentiaries around that actually strengthened your organization. But yeah, yes. But I'm just trying what in the whole reason that we're bringing this back from from my perspective is mm -hmm. the when you effectively have that 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 threat of violence mm -hmm. that that you can predict with the the power that it can have and you would think in in a group like this that it wouldn't be as powerful because you'd think everybody's that way but they're not there's only mm -hmm. a few people even in a criminal environment like that that are the true leaders and that, that yeah. really ha have it those but could you just talk to that a little bit I can, yeah. It, it's 
again, it goes back to the infrastructure itself. Violence is, as you correctly point out, the currency that you're dealing with, but it's how you utilize that violence um, that becomes all important. Again, you don't want to infringe upon your business activities because that reduces your profit. So you find other models or modalities um, that will work just as well. And that again comes back to infrastructure. So for instance, communication. Uh, normally within a controlled environment, um, you don't have communication so that they isolate and they separate. In my particular case, um, they didn't have cell phones back then, but they did have CB radios. So I smuggled in CB radios and had CB radios uh, held in each one of the units. And I used um, um, encrypted communications uh, that were given to them in the visiting room that they would take to other institutions. So it's, um, it's like a supply chain, if you will, relative to that, and then you have a command center. But that also goes to controlling uh, your environment. When you talk about controlling your resources, um, we had control over every job in the institution. So that's a matter of strategically placing individuals in those jobs so that when an individual is ducketed or whatever's going on in the prison, um, as a clerk, um, as a storeroom, in the kitchen, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You had, even from the whole, absolute control over that. So you knew exactly what was happening, when it was happening, and how it was happening. And when you have that available to you, that increases your potential. Um, and everyone knows that. So that, that, again, that violence as currency, um, grows a hundredfold because you don't actually have to use and use the violence itself it's the potential right. knowing that you have control over the institution and that if you need to you can impose whatever violence necessary right. um, that's a real deterrent relative to the population itself and as it relates to the guards also because they were aware of it they used to take i've had him say it to me that what goes on inside the prison is on you we control the perimeter. Their number one priority, even to this day, it's written into the rules, is the protection of the public. Right. So essentially what they're doing is preventing individuals from escaping. And that's their primary job. Just that. So that um, when you do control an environment like a prison, you have a population from 3,000 to 5,000 individuals. It's a small town, a small city. And then you, you, inst you install your own... Um, subsets associated with that prostitution drug trafficking alcohol um loans it, it's it's a small city and so it's uh, it's a power base and, and it isn't to say that um that violence doesn't occur it does but it's controlled violence as it relates to if there's an issue then you surgically um approach that issue and deal with it so that it doesn't impact upon um, the totality of what you're doing by way of controlling your resources. And by that, I mean simply uh, the institution doesn't go on lockdown uh, because that, that infringes upon your profit margin. Um, and so you're providing protection um, to other organizations, uh, which we did at Old Folsom, you know, relative to um, biker groups um, that didn't have the um wherewithal right. within that controlled environment like they do on the street where they all run together but if they were one or two of them there then they didn't have the standing to protect themselves uh, so if for instance um by, again by way of controlling the resources and that infrastructure uh, one of those biker groups had control of uh, the methamphetamine trade on the street um, then that was a huge resource by way of having access to that right. uh, in exchange for protection. And now you're paying the guards to bring that in and you're paying members of the administration to allow that to happen. And uh, so that uh, there's, there's a profit margin there for everybody. Um, Mike, is, is, some, is some of that, is some of that uh, with, with uh, drugs coming in and people looking the other way, obviously I know some of them are just getting bribed, but is, uh, mm -hmm. is, is there, was there at that time, I'm not saying today, but at the time was it more like, well, you know what? If we if we allow them to be drugged up, there'd be less of a problem, you know. Like mm. if we keep them, uh, if we keep the population a, a little more drug, we give them that ability. Is that it, was there any of that while they're looking, you know, kind of looking the other way? 
or was it just purely purely profit? Well, I, mean, I think there's both. I mean, it started off with the idea that you want to remember back then, uh, although the uh, the guards union um, had been established, I think in 1956 by Dick Novi, um, they made just above minimum wage, right. so that if you could offer an individual um, a half a year salary for one shipment, bringing one shipment in, um, that was quite an incentive. Um, and if, you know, no harm was coming to that individual or to that individual's, um, peer group, other guards. Right. Um, and so that protection was provided, um, as it relates to that, uh, you know, that dynamic shifted, um, drastically in later years when they began building new prisons and they began to understand, um, you know, essentially what was needed. Uh, Dick Novi's son, Don Novi took over the union. And he uh, acquired peace officer status for him, uh, same pay grade as uh, uh, CHP officers, a memorandum of understanding. And so uh, as they were elevated uh, in their standing as guards to peace officers, they were allowed to carry weapons. Um, the benefits changed drastically. They could actually make a decent living. And so you know the psychology associated with that uh, changed. And um, what was required of uh, the organizations of organized crime um, deeply embedded within um, uh, the infrastructure of prison itself uh, was adaptation. And um, of course, the groups did adapt. So then the psychology changed, the philosophy changed, the psychology changed insofar as how you approach that. Um, but again, the primary currency was violence. Um, First and foremost, it allowed it you to control. Is. It allowed you to control all the logistics, which is you know any military yes. campaign. Usually, it's mm -hmm. the better logistics that ends up winning. It's not as sexy as the warriors are, but it's no. the, the. But that's that's what you know. Yes. The, the the warriors without logistics can't survive long. And, you can uh, shut down within a prison environment. You can shut down a potential war um, through the utilization of drugs. You know that's supply and demand characteristic. Right. So that because everyone understands that, and particularly when the vast majority of individuals that you're dealing with are are dope fiends, um, they're going to give priority to accessibility to that drug as opposed to violence in place of it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so there is that supply and demand characteristic associated with uh, that dynamic, um, and it becomes um, critical uh, toward understanding. The environment you're dealing with um the uh <clears throat> the new yorker article that i originally mm -hmm. read in, in 2000 they talked about um the the encouragement of education um at the at the at the, the heights of, of the prison gang especially the Aryan brotherhood they talked about um that you guys were encouraged to read you know uh like nietzsche your you know mustache's book of five rings art of war you guys are very familiar with these texts. Um, but on the other side, too, I believe that they, they hinted to a, uh, yeah, uh, that the Brotherhood had taken on a contract and they failed to kill the individual in time before the CERT team got there um, and, and broke it up. And after that, there was a push to understand to kill more effectively. Um, you know, because of what you're saying, they, they need they need the currency, they need the, the logistics, they need the power to control the yard, they can't afford to get something wrong like that. And then uh, there was a push to actually a study, you know, anatomy, so people understood how to better, you know, kill get faster results. Can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, I can. It, it, it's one of the things that I emphasized, in addition to reading philosophy, um, and even poetry, if you will. Um, is Gray's Anatomy. And um, it becomes important to understand anatomically um, what you're confronting by way of um, optimizing the kill factor. Um, if you send an individual, and first and foremost, you need to understand is that you don't put the knife into a hand of an individual that um, is incapable of violence, um, which isn't to say that you don't recruit that individual and use them within the capacity that they have the aptitude for, uh, whatever that may be, may, that could be just dealing drugs, right. and that they're, they're a very good hustler, but uh, they're terrible at violence. 
Right. So it's the effective utilization of your resources as it relates to the group itself. But uh, anatomically, um, you know, that becomes um, part of the training. Uh, you know, you have heavy bags and, and different things like that, but to, to study the anatomy and um, how best to um, dispatch, literally dispatch your victim right. um, becomes critical, you know, in that. Because so, you may only have seconds and so that it did you know if it if it's a knife through the eye or uh, you know through the ear uh, if it's taking the the juggler in the windpipe in one swipe and then uh, a single strike to the heart uh, to ensure uh, the death you know that can happen in a matter of seconds and so that training uh, did occur right. um, and uh, with purpose with reason and uh, it becomes part of the skill set you know, you have uh, other organizations that um, utilize uh, sub-factions within their faction that are trained specifically for that reason. And then, of course, you have uh, another faction or element of that that are considered expendable. And so that would be what was referred to as a suicide mission, that you know you're sending the individual into a situation where he's probably going to be shot and killed as a result of what he's doing. Um, so by, the focus by, by there the guards, is, most likely. Yes. Yeah, by the mm -hmm. guards, they're going to yeah. do that, and so they and they know full well that that's going to happen. Yes, but again, that was a matter of choice. If um, one of the first things I did um, was institute a policy of no drug use upon penalty of death, um, but never went there with that, so that. There was an understanding that if you were caught using drugs or you continued to use drugs and that was evident, then you were considered expendable. And by that, I simply mean that the next mission that came up that was required, um, again, that suicide mission, right. um, you were apt to be assigned that. And uh, it wasn't then at that point a question of choice. Um, now, the individual, only choice he did have is, was that he could complete the mission or he could lock up. And uh, some did lock up right. uh, rather than complete the mission. Um, and that's called being in trouble with the gang or being, being in trouble with the organization so that um, you know you're going to be hit uh, as a result of being in trouble with the gang. And, and you see that uh, quite often uh, still to this day. Well, the the other thing that that is of interest is you didn't it wasn't just the prison population that that mm -hmm. you made impressions on um beer and brotherhood according to you know the articles that that are, are that are read um has the distinction of in one day um two separate occasions two separate incidents uh killing prison guards you know uh, yes. simultaneously the manner in which it was done is stunning to me to any it's it's you know to people that aren't familiar with it these were men that were shackled. These were men that were being led through. They did it in a very public way because, of course, they were sending the message across. But can you talk about how these shackled men, what, what that, because it, it, it's not a one time thing. I remember you and I were talking about this. It, it actually, mm -hmm. you utilize this, this, uh, this type of a, uh, a setup as well. How, how a shackled man can all of a sudden find himself unshackled and free, to, you know, free and clear to fight. Um, yeah. You know, in a, in a situation, I mean, people can't imagine being led through by guards shackled, and then you can create a scenario because of your control of the environment, because of the logistics mm -hmm. that uh, you guys were just impervious to, you know, being intimidated by it, by that situation. Right. It's actually where training comes in. It, um, I'll preface uh, the killing of guards with um, a brief story about uh, coming in from the yard. Uh, in San Quentin, for instance. And so uh, knowing that you're a target um, for other factions of organized crime, whether it be the Black Rella family or the Mexican Mafia or the Texas Syndicate, whomever it may be, that when you're brought in, you're escorted in off the yard. Um, and so in my particular case, I had individuals who had targeted me for assassination and uh, they would cut the bars out of their cell. And so they knew that what time I was going to be escorted in and I was had handcuffed behind my back and the guard would escort in. You come through two locked gates 
and then you're on the tier. And so once I had arrived on the tier, you could see the person's head poke out from their cell where they'd cut the bars. And um, the idea is they'd have a knife out in front of them and they were gonna come out and I was handcuffed and the guards were ordered when things like that occurred to run off the tier, which they did. Um, and perfectly understandable. But what I had put in place uh, by way of training and protocol was that uh, someone was always inside on the tier. You always left one man in a cell on the tier with a handcuff key. So that if that did occur, I simply, when the guard ran off the tier, went over and had them unlock my cuffs. And then I would meet, they'd give me a knife and I would meet my opponent on the tier like that. It never actually got to that uh, because in the situations where they attempted to do that with me, my assailant got stuck in the bars uh, because he didn't cut enough bars out. Um, and um, so I was given the choice whether to kill him, uh, being stuck in the bars, um, and I chose, I elected not to. I pushed him back in, um, took his weapon from him, of course. So I'll leave that story there and just um, fast forward to the idea of killing guards. Uh, it's actually somewhat of a pet peeve with me. Um, and the reason is, is that when I stepped away from the brand, um, you know, I, I did so for a number of reasons. Uh, and one of them was the escalation of violence against um, individuals that I considered innocent. And that would actually include guards. Right. Um, you know, they're doing a job. They're hired to do a job. They do their job and that's it. But um, in this particular instance, I knew that um, guards were going to be set up to be killed. Um, and so when I stepped away from the brand and I met with law enforcement, I advised them that this was going to happen. And um, they wouldn't believe, they actually polygraphed me on it. And even though I passed the polygraph, they, the organizations of organized crime within the prison system had taken a position previously that they would never harm guards because of the consequences and the ramifications of doing that. Right. Now they were going to step that up. So they simply would not believe that they had taken that step away from previous policy. And so uh, they didn't do anything about it. And two weeks later, um, at a facility, uh, as you correctly point out, um, in shackles, under escort, um, two individuals uh, went to a cell, had the handcuffs taken off, were handed a knife, and literally butchered um, the guards on the tier. Uh, one of them, well, both were tragic. Right. But in this one particular case, um, the guard that was being murdered, his son was also a guard and he was standing on the other side of the bars. He could not get to his father. And uh, the individual that was murdering him drug his father up to him and brutally stabbed him to death. And um, was totally unnecessary, totally unnecessary, you know, and that's why I say it's a pet peeve with me. And then um, the following, I think it was two days later, or the next day later, a similar circumstance in the same prison, same thing, um, went to a cell, had the cuffs removed, got a knife and um, murdered the guard on the tier. Um, and that was just an escalation in the violence itself, it not only as it relates to the guards within prison, but also on the street. Um, attempts were made to assassinate guards um, on the street. And, um, you know, then suddenly law enforcement came back to me and they said, oh, um, you know, we didn't believe this was going to happen. And I just simply told them, go tell that to their families. Um, do, you, do you think it's because they didn't, <clears throat> they, they, because of the attitude of, you know, you said the guards, hey, what, what happens in here is on you guys. We're at the perimeter. We're doing that. Do you think it was just an indifference and not thinking, thinking there was this agreed upon uh, situation where they didn't even have to concern themselves with anything like that to where, and, and that's maybe why they didn't use counterintelligence. They didn't really take you seriously when you were saying that until obviously, you know, this tragedy happens. 
Well, first and foremost, they knew my status within the organization. So that when I stepped away, I mean, I, it was, uh, you can't believe how many different law enforcement agencies came to see me, yeah. you know, relative to intelligence and, and what was going on and, and uh, murders that had been committed. And, um, well, well, just and so, so people understand, you were on the highest council right there with yeah. two mm -hmm. founders. I mean, you're, you're right. right. We don't need to say names or anything, but I mean, you were no. there. At, at, you couldn't be at a more influential level no. in, that, in that organization no. and that's that right. to me is fascinating that I, i've seen this theme time and time again where people discount um they 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 don't understand the mm. human condition they don't understand just how committed you know a lot of these individuals are in these organizations to the point i mean that was one thing that my interaction with corrections it was really, you know, interesting for the commitment level that these groups, these various groups have towards their mission and the lengths that they're able to do. And I, I what I use the term is a very high concept, low tech, because you don't have access to the technology, but you had leaders in your organization that were locked up 23 hours a day and were still able to run the organization. Yes. And I mean, yes. that's, I, yes. that's mind boggling. I was one of them. Yeah, yeah, I was one of them. But you know, the issue here is, and what we're talking about here is um, intelligence as it relates to law enforcement. So, uh, and I ran across this uh, a number of times once I did step away. You know, you have individuals who are put in place to gather intelligence on the organizations. And oftentimes, what would happen is that very disinformation that I was feeding them through their conduits, they had um, subscribed to. And as such, they considered that the law as it relates to the, those individuals that they were studying, not realizing that uh, I had fed them that disinformation. So I knew what they were thinking. And so uh, these individuals that were in this position of authority and had acquired this so-called intelligence um, adhered to it as if it was the law, as if it was uh, scripture. Um, and they would not deviate that because now that was um, an infringement upon their expertise and and their ego would not allow that i mean that's just simply the way that i see it and you know that's that type of posturing relative to that i saw that time and time again as i i, I got deeper into working with law enforcement by way of the intelligence that they thought they had gathered uh, it was faulty intelligence and i could tell them precisely where it came from and when you know, they acquired it and from whom they acquired it from. Um, and that kind of set them back on their heels a little bit. But it was the same thing when, you know, they asked me to testify against the brand in a RICO prosecution. They had indicted 40 individuals, death penalty case, and I declined. I refused. And uh, they were highly upset. Um, and so one of those individuals that was with the department, who was supposed to be an expert on the brand, um, once I declined to cooperate with them in the RICO prosecution, said, oh, well, he's lying about the brand. And that was supposed to discredit me. But the whole reason that I wouldn't involve myself with that prosecution is that the individuals they were using were lying. And ultimately, when they went into trial and they were exposed as liars and they lost their case. Right. Um, and they shut the whole thing down because of that. And again, you get into personality conflicts and egos and this idea that, you know, I'm the professional here and, and I've acquired this intelligence and I know what's really going on. Um, and it was faulty um, to the point where it resulted in the death of uh, innocent people. Uh, and there's no excuse for that. You know, and one of the things that you, one of the things that I discovered um, in dealing with law enforcement is that back then they weren't sharing intelligence you know they would they would hoard it they would hold on to it um as opposed to share it and um uh, you know come together with their resources and and, and come up with a uh, a plan you know relative to dealing with that um and a lot of that goes towards the idea that they have this preconceived notion that they're dealing with idiots um you know these are just a bunch of thugs that they they don't have any sense of uh, uh intelligence or common sense. And um, they certainly didn't uh, stop to consider that counterintelligence was being used against them. Um, 
And so it was an awakening for them in that, you know, but with that uh, comes a price, you know, relative to the things that I was doing. I mean, the first case that I testified in, um, <laughs> the individual that was in charge of my security detail wanted me to go into court and testify to something that wasn't true. And I refused to do it. And um, he set me up. He put me in a jail that night and exposed me to a number of prisoners that I spent all night fighting. I mean, you know, the stories go on and on and on. But again, it comes back to that idea of violence being used as currency by both both parties, you know, right. the law enforcement side and, and the organized crime faction side. So now you find yourself in a situation where who do you trust, you know, relative to that. Um, and it becomes exceedingly difficult. You know, you had um, uh, the Department of Justice investigate uh, these very things that I'm talking about. And uh, the transcripts are fascinating. Um, you know, you had one law enforcement individual that was a captain uh, who testified against the Senate Select Committee. And um, I remember that um, the chairman um, of that committee um, stopped mid-stride when this captain took the witness stand and said, excuse me, sir, are you wearing a bulletproof vest? And he said, yeah, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, why? And he said, well, because uh, I've had drive-by shootings at my house and I fear for my life. She said, from law enforcement? And he said, yes. Um, you know, and then that gets into the idea of the Green Wall, you know, which was a gang of prison guards. Um, again, but that's an entirely different story. The point is, is that um, it's not always what you think it is uh, when you're dealing with that. Now, in those transcripts, there are thousands of pages. Uh, I'm the only prisoner mentioned in there. And uh, there was a reason for that. Uh, that was because of what I was involved in by way of testimony, you know, my testimony um, against an, a faction of organized crime, uh, where you had the execution of a, a woman and her two six-year-old twin daughters in the, the manner in which they were executed. And, um, you know, there were every indication that um, members of, of uh, law enforcement within the prison community were aware of this and uh, attempted to keep me from testifying in that case by threatening my family openly. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot to be said. And again, these are just stories. But I, I think the important thing here, particularly as it relates to your audience, is that they, they acquire a broader picture um, you know, of actually what's going on. Um, and that they, they, they see firsthand uh, as a result of, of um, perhaps enhancing their perspective of the potential uh, for violence, even in society today. You know, when we look at these groups today, these hate groups, you know, these white supremacists and, and these other hate groups, um, the very dynamic that you and I are talking about right now is employed there. Right. Um, and they may be subject to that. So it, it really comes down to the very thing that you're involved in, Tim, and that is uh, attempting to educate them about the realities of these things. Um, and to my way of thinking, that's why you and I are having this conversation. Well, is to yeah, Michael, that, the, that the other thing. So we're going to end it there for part one. A um, <clears throat> couple things for takeaways. First of all, uh, the long format is incredible. This, this two-part series that I've done to date is probably the most profound um, information that I've been able to get from, uh, you know, somebody that's actually had to live it and use it. I hope everybody understands, you know, this is not a glorification of uh, prison gangs. This is just getting good raw uh, material that you can work on and probably cutting through a lot of the myths. You know, in part two, we talk more, Mike talks more about, uh, you know, using a knife, multiple attackers, going up against somebody with a knife when you don't have one. Um, a lot of very practical, you know, knowledge and also talking about the current state of prison and prisoners and uh, violence. Um, all of it's extremely relative. I mean, I, I hope you understand it. this takes it beyond the idea of two guys getting into some pushy match or some worthless thing. When, when you see how people actually use violence to dominate a, a socially violent area and control it and you understand the methodologies behind it and what works and what doesn't work. 
there's just lots of really interesting information that you can use to better conduct your life to minimize the chance of violence coming in your life. That's why voices like Mike Thompson's are worth listening to. Um, Mike, you know, for the last 20 years really has uh, changed, uh, you know, changed his focus. He left the brand because of, uh, you know, because they went after, they started going after family members. That's, that was it for him. You know, he felt that that was out of line, out of character with what the original intent was of the gang. He is very straight up about if you're in the lifestyle, you're in the lifestyle, you're free game. Everybody knows what's up. But when you start getting innocence, you know, family members and non, uh, you know, you know, civilians, basically, um, then then he had a problem with that and he left and that's that's where he's been very consistent you know I've, I've looked at his stuff for over the last 20 years and he has been consistent all the way through also you may be confused with the idea of him being in the Aryan Brotherhood and thinking that this is a white supremacist organization and as he accurately talks about in other interviews uh, that's not the case he has a Native American background um, Native Americans I think as he said you know got him into the Aryan Brotherhood um, but again, it's about power and, and that's it with a lot of organizations. It's also recruited by the Black Rilla family, also recruited by, uh, um, uh, the, uh, Black Panthers, you know, originally. And, uh, you know, he ended up going with the Aryan Brotherhood because there were Native American members of the Aryan Brotherhood who told him it was a better lifestyle for what he was facing. Um, Mike's organization, it's, it is listed below, um, live, lead and prosper. Um, it's, it's an organization he puts together that where he's helping prisoners make the transition. You know, uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow. And, but if you're interested in that and helping the organization, it's a, uh, it's a worthwhile, uh, goal. I've been involved with a lot of prison reform movements and, um, we have to realize the society, these people are going to be coming back out in the streets. So where are we going to invest our time? You know, are we going to make the attempt to help them transition and possibly keep them from being recidivists or not? Um, it's, it's, it's something our society has to deal with. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, more, more on that in part two. Hope you enjoyed this.